The following program is brought to you by Whiteman TV. All content in the Stay Strong, Live Long Falls Prevention Education Series has been created for informational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this television production. Welcome to our Stay Strong, Live Long Falls Prevention Education Series brought to you by the VON, the Upper Grand Family Health Team and our community partners as well. I want to start off by saying that falling is the leading cause of injury-related death among seniors and the number one contributor to loss of independent living. In fact, one in three seniors 65 and older will fall each year and falling once doubles one's chance to fall again. It is our hope that through this Whiteman Telecom production that we can change these statistics in Wellington County, empowering our community with the knowledge and the tools to prevent future falls. Today's session includes the topic of our blood pressure and the ups and downs of that blood pressure. And this is brought to you today by Lisa Melbourne. Lisa Melbourne is a registered nurse and she's actually our cardiac and respiratory nurse specialist with the Upper Grand Family Health Team. Thank you so much, Lisa. Great, thank you. All right, so today we're going to be talking about blood pressure and people will hear that, that term. So first of all, we're going to go through a little bit about what the heart does and then how the blood pressure is affected by how the heart is functioning. And then what happens when your blood pressure goes up and when your blood pressure goes down and how that sets you up for risk of falls. Okay. So first, let's just take a look at the heart. And up in that, the picture that you see, you have the heart that's sitting in the middle of your chest. It's four chambers. And it has a really important function. It pushes your blood all throughout your body. So that heart pushes blood that has your oxygen in it and your nutrients from your body, pushes it up to your head, it goes out to your chest, down to your abdomen, down to your legs, and it continues this pattern constantly. It never gets a chance to stop. Your heart rate will typically go, your heart will beat typically uh, between 60 and 80 beats a minute. And on average, most people's heart rates or pulse will be running around 80 beats. So when you think of how much, how hard this pump has to go, 80 beats a minute, and that is actually 4,800 beats an hour, 115,000 beats a day, 42 million beats a year. And then if you multiply that out to living to age 80, that's 3.3 billion beats. The heart never gets a chance to stop. There is no other uh, mechanical device that exists that can do that much work without running into problems. So how does it get the nutrients from the heart out to the body? It goes out through your blood vessels, through the arteries, and through the veins. Okay, so there's different things that will affect your blood pressure. We have how well is your heart actually functioning, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to also talk about the volume or that the blood that has to be pushed around. There's conditions where the volume is too high, and there's, uh, there's situations when your blood volume is too low. Both of those scenarios set up a, a situation where your blood pressure can cause a fall and cause you to feel unsteady and unwell. And then we also have resistance out in the system making it again harder for the heart to do its job. All those millions of beats and if it's having to push against a system that's too tight or too loose, it makes it very difficult for the heart. Okay. Okay, so the blood pressure, we, we have our pulse that we, we can feel your pulse and you say, yep, yeah, my heart seems to be beating pretty regularly. But a really good indicator of your heart health is actually your blood pressure. 
okay? It's defined as the measure of the force of the blood that's being exerted against the walls of the blood vessels. Okay, it's based on two measurements. Does anybody know those two measurements? I'd like to hear somebody say what numbers they know. What are those things? Systolic and diastolic, is that what you mean? Yep, yes. right? Yeah. So there's those two measures. So the first one, right, systolic pressure and diastolic. Okay, so when you're at the doctor's office, when you're at the pharmacy and you're getting your blood pressure checked, that first number that pops up, that's your systolic. And then the, the following number that shows up, that's your diastolic. And that gives us a really good indicator of how well your heart is working. Okay, so I have a little video here, so we're just going to put this on. The normal heart has two sides, a right side and a left side, and four chambers, the top receiving chambers, or atrium, and the lower chambers, which are thick-walled pumping chambers called ventricles. Red blood cell will come from either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava and enter into the right atrium. The blood then flows across the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. The right ventricle then squeezes and ejects that blood cell into a vessel called the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery splits into two vessels, each going to the lungs. As that red blood cell makes its way through the lung, it returns through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. That blood is now oxygenated. It's picked up oxygen, then goes across the mitral valve into the left ventricle, which does most of the work in terms of delivery of blood flow to the body. That blood cell is now ejected into the aorta to some organ or muscle or skin in the human body. Great, okay. So that just gives you an idea of all the traveling that that blood has to do. So again, that systolic pressure that's the pressure that happens when the heart has to squeeze the blood to get the blood from the heart out to the rest of the body. So it's that squeezing number, that's the first pressure that we, we typically hear when we're checking your blood pressure. Then the second number, that diastolic pressure, it's just as important because as the heart squeezes, it pushes the blood out. Then the heart has to relax and then the heart has to actually fill back up. So those numbers, again, that bottom number is really important because if that pressure is too low or too high, the heart isn't going to get a chance to refill and be ready to go again, right? Thinking of the millions and millions of times it's beating during the course of your day, it's really important that that heart is getting the proper amount of pressure and it's able to not have to work any harder than it has to. Okay? so. Typically, a person, we have a picture up here, and there's di different numbers, but going up the top of the scale, you have your systolic, and going across the bottom is your diastolic. So that first blue square that you're seeing, that is 90, and then the other number on the bottom part of the screen, that's 60. So if a person's blood pressure is right around 90 over 60, we would say that's low. In some medical conditions, we're okay with that low blood pressure as long as the person isn't experiencing dizziness, isn't experiencing faintness, okay? Textbook perfect blood pressure is 120 over 80. So those are numbers that are in that green zone. And that it means that the heart is able to do the right amount of work, not having to overexert itself to get your blood, to get the nutrients out to the rest of your body. Then for people who are in that 120 over 40 zone, we, we have to be careful that we're just watching what you're doing as far as uh, managing your diet and your exercise and different things because we're, we're just starting to see some changes. And as we age, we naturally lose some ability in our, to manage our blood pressures as well as we've had when we were younger. And so we just, we keep watching these people, okay? And then the, that last great big red area, you have blood pressures of 140 over and 190, that zone there. So if your top number is in that, that zone, you would be considered to have high blood pressure. But I just want to caution everybody just to remember that your blood pressure is your blood pressure and everybody has different things and reasons why your blood pressure might be higher or lower. But the main thing that you need to know is what are your numbers and what are your numbers? Is that good for you or is that concerning? Okay. 
So again, as a reminder, we are starting to see and we are diagnosing people with high blood pressure when it's more than 140 over 90. And we're concerned about low blood pressure and falls if a person has a blood pressure over 90 over 60. Okay, so here's just another image and it shows the different linings of a blood vessel. And it shows, I know there's lots of extra letters up there, but I apologize for that. But hopefully what you're going to get the idea of is there's the little blood cells that are going through and you're actually going to see this picture pulsating. And it's going to show you how that innermost layer of the artery is not being overstretched. And then it, later on it's going to show you how it becomes overstretched when the blood pressure is too high. So here's the image where the physician, the <coughs> nurse, we're checking your blood pressure. We're using a blood pressure cuff or a spigmatometer, something like that. Okay, but here we go. We have our sam um, we have a picture of the the systolic pressure, the <coughs> force that has to be used to push that blood out. And then as the heart relaxes, it's filling back up. There's your diastolic pressure. So this is a constant, remember this is a constant pattern. Okay, so this is a nice image where the person's blood pressure is under good control, it's 120 over 80, and that inner lining isn't, doesn't look as though it's being overstretched. Now this person's blood pressure is higher, it's 140, so see how that most inner lining is actually much bigger, it's thicker, and it's really being propelled a lot further away. And then for a person whose blood pressure is lower, everything is collapsed down a little bit and you're not actually seeing as much good blood flow go through. This is just going to progress to show you how when blood pressure is not under good control, this is how a stroke would happen in a person's brain. Okay, so, and then this picture, as the arteries are getting stretched, they get worn out and cholesterol or debris, uh, higher blood sugars, get stuck in that little area and then it causes what's happening now is their atherosclerosis where things are just making it more narrow and now the heart has to work even harder to push from the bigger open area down through that really small tube and then back through the other area. So this is how heart attacks happen and strokes happen. Okay. So now this is a non-video picture, but again, just to give you a chance to see that you have your blood vessel, you have your artery, and as blood is flowing through, so again, that, that normal blood pressure of 120 over 80, that's on the far side. And then in the middle, perhaps this is where the person's just starting to have problems with higher blood pressure, but not perhaps diagnosed or not being medicated. And then as the person progresses and they're not able to make some changes, then you have that building up of plaque, you have that damage that occurs so everything starts smushing in, and now you have hypertension. So the heart that's trying to push that blood through is having to push through a much smaller tube. Okay? So imagine yourself on the 401 and we're driving along and you're on the eight, eight lane section and traffic is flowing nicely. And then further on, now we've closed two lanes on either side, so everybody starts smushing in, smushing in. Start to feel a little bit nervous. Now we have a, an accident, something has happened, so now you're, you're down to two lanes of highway. This represents what's happening to your heart, because your heart is trying to push those blood cells, push those nutrients through an area where the tube has really gotten a whole lot smaller, and it's not happy. To get the, the blood cells through, it actually has to push harder to get the, that blood through those areas. Okay, so signs of high blood pressure. Does anybody, can, I'm looking, wondering about what people think about your warning signs of having high blood pressure. Headaches. Headaches. Any other signs, any other ways of knowing if you have high blood pressure? Dizzy. Yeah, dizziness, right? Um, we used to always think that, but now we actually realize that there are no true signs of hypertension. Uh, it's often called now the silent killer, and lots of people don't know that they have high blood pressure until the complications have happened. 
So again, it's really important for people to know what their blood pressure is and is this a good blood pressure reading that they're getting right now? How does this compare to where they were a year ago? Okay. But also when you know what your numbers are, then you also have the ability to look at your health conditions, your lifestyle, your genetic factors, to see what else is putting you at risk so that you actually have a chance to make some changes around your lifestyle and hopefully prevent that stroke, that heart attack, that fall. Okay? Right? So what are some things that will cause a person to have high blood pressure that we cannot change? Okay, so the older we get, we're more likely to have high blood pressure. So we can't change our age. Right now, most people, uh, we can't change the sex. So at, typically, uh, before age 60, gentlemen seem to be getting mo more high blood pressure. But then as women get up to age 60, 65, we're more at risk of high blood pressure. We also have a lot of genetic components that we have no ability to change. So if your parents, your uncle, your aunts, if they all had complications of high blood pressure, you want to make sure that you're aware of that and that you've been talking to your physician to let them know that there is some family history so you really have to be more aware and more actively looking to make sure your blood pressure is under control. There's also different races that will have a higher tendency for high blood pressure and that's something you have no control over. But now let's flip the coin onto the other side. What can we actually change to decrease our risk of high blood pressure? Is there anything that you have already thought of that you've learned in previous episodes that you can do to improve your blood pressure or your health? Yes. Exercise. Exercise, right? <laughs> what else can we change to eating, make sure? Eating healthy. Eating healthy, right? So the, the things that we can change, we have, we need to exercise more, we need to be eating healthier. We also have to look at our alcohol consumption because alcohol has a huge impact on being able to control your blood pressure. Alcohol acts as a diuretic and we'll get into that later on, but it's a chemical that will actually cause you to get rid of more fluid. As well as the actions of alcohol that that those feelings where you get a little bit dizzy, a little bit tipsy, that's a, a, that's a problem because it's putting you at risk of a fall. As well as when your body is breaking down the alcohol, more of your blood is being concentrated to your GI system or to your digestive system. So that the blood that you want going to the rest of your body is being diverted to break that down. Okay, so you can take a look at your alcohol consumption and see if you want to make some changes around that. People who smoke, they're at a higher risk of developing high blood pressure. And we have at our uh, family health team, we have a program that's available for people who want to get help with quitting smoking. People who have diabetes, I'm sure there's been other discussions about diabetes and how to eat healthy and how to bring down that risk factor. But if you can get your diabetes under control and if you can keep your, your blood sugars at a more healthier numbers between four and seven, four and six, right? You're actually lowering the chances of you developing high blood pressure. Then if your diet, as you had said, was if we can look at healthier ways of eating and we do that because we're trying to avoid having elevated cholesterols and elevated triglycerides. If you think back to that slide where you saw those little pieces of yellowness that would sort of catch on and then it causes uh, more damage inside the blood vessels, if we can actually decrease the amount of cholesterols that we're eating, it's going to make it easier for us to have a, a nicer blood pressure. People who have too much salt in their diet, they're at risk of high blood pressure as well and oftentimes it's just a little bit of doing some research and some reading and figuring out how you can decrease your salt intake and still enjoy your food. Okay? Obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and stress are also on the list. So we have different programs that are available here at the Family Health Team and out in our community to bring down those risk factors to help you become more active and help you manage stress. Okay. So before when we, we talked about, well, what are the signs of high blood pressure, 
In the past, what people would say is that, well, if I have high blood pressure, I'm, I'm having maybe a stroke, a heart attack, heart failure, kidney failure, or blindness. Those are the long-term complications of having high blood pressure. And sometimes that, when those conditions are diagnosed, that's the only way that high blood pressure gets recognized and gets treated. So in that earlier video, we showed at the top there how the blood vessel, how it's been narrowed, how it's been damaged, and it actually will spring a little bit of a leak, or it will tear open, causing a stroke. In another slide, we'll show how those blood vessels become even more narrowed and will cause a heart attack. Then when I had talked about how hard that heart has to, to work and if it has to push constantly at a pressure of 160, 170, 180, the muscle starts to react and it actually gets bigger. And in this case, a bigger heart muscle is not what you want. A bigger heart muscle actually makes your heart weaker. And d people will often develop heart failure as a result of untreated uh, high blood pressure, okay? Then when you think of trying to force all of those, those blood cells through the blood vessels, but now they're in a really tight little vessel, the vessels that are in your kidneys and in your eyes and some other organs and in, even in your toes, they're really small and fragile. So if we're forcing cells through those, they're gonna become damaged and they're not gonna work anymore. So oftentimes people will have problems with their eyes or with their kidneys. Okay, so I've come back to this slide just to, just to remind everybody. So we're back thinking about how well is our heart functioning? How much resistance does that heart have to deal with every day? And the blood volume, how much is it having to push around? Okay, so congested heart failure. So we had just talked about that a bit, but I just want you to have a really good idea because high blood pressure, we can treat. We can treat and manage heart failure, but if we can avoid it, you will be feeling a whole lot better as you age. When you take a look at the, those two images of the heart there on the screen, and you look at how much blood can go into those chambers, compared to how much blood can go into the chambers that's a heart that's struggling with congestive heart failure, you can see how that person is not gonna be getting the nutrients, is not gonna be getting enough oxygen, is not gonna feel very well about exercising, is probably gonna be at risk of a fall, and they're gonna be on lots of medications that could possibly cause a fall or problems with high blood pressure or lower blood pressure, okay? So then, now if you flip on to the other side there of the, of the screen, you're thinking of heart attacks. This is a complication of high blood pressure. And when you're, you're looking at the blood vessel and on the, the small little insert picture there, you see that buildup of that yellow stuff. So that's plaque, right? And the blood has to get through. And even though the heart is pushing blood through millions and millions of time during the course of your life, that heart muscle actually needs its own blood supply. So you have to be uh, very aggressive with treating high blood pressure and cholesterol because you want to avoid having a heart attack. Yes. What do you have congestive heart failure you don't have high blood pressure? Say that again, sorry? What if you have congestive heart failure yep. you don't have high blood pressure? So your congestive heart failure might have been caused from other, other health issues. So if a person has lung problems, then a congestive heart failure could actually result as because the heart is having to try to push into lungs that are stiffer. Congestive heart failure can also develop when a person's diabetes isn't under control. It can be a side effect of medications for chemotherapy. There's a lot of different other reasons that will cause congestive heart failure, not just high blood pressure. What if you got irregular blood pressure and you're not concerned about it? So if you have irregular blood yeah. pressure? So we would try to figure out. Uh, and, and the doctor was my, not the doctor now, but my other doctor right? wasn't concerned about it. Okay, so when blood pressures are high and low, we have to try to figure out why and if we can give something to help modify so the pressures are more consistent so that your heart isn't having to work too hard and then not work hard enough. 
Uh, oftentimes it's, a, it's looking at a lot of other different risk factors. How well are you breathing at night? Are, oftentimes people will struggle with blood pressures if they're supposed to be using a CPAP machine and they're not able to use it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Right? If a person is really dealing with high levels of stress at different points of time and then, and then stress is well controlled, their pressures are going to be high one day and then not so much the next day. Did that answer your question okay? Yep, okay. All right, so now too slow, too fast. So we have different medical conditions, different medications that will actually cause your heart to go so slow. And that brain and the rest of your body wants the same blood pressure, it wants the same amount of nutrients, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't care if your heart is deciding to go so slow. So when that happens, when your heart rate slows down, either because we've made it with other medications or something else is happening with your heart, your veins and your arteries have to contract to make sure that they get that constant flow of blood. So that's a problem because now your heart is struggling for whatever reason with a slow heartbeat and now you're, we've just made its work even harder because we've tightened up the system, okay? Then if you flip over on that other side of the screen and there's that fast rhythm, so I know not everybody knows how to read an ECG, but that doesn't look normal. So a heartbeat of 223, that's too fast. So you're thinking if a heart is trying to pump at 223, it's not gonna have time to fill up, push out, relax, and do that whole cycle over and over again. I just keep thinking of uh, I Love Lucy, where the episode where they're trying to pull all the chocolates well, off, that right? I love that that's episode. that's that what's happening in the favorite. heart. Yeah. So the heart's going as fast as it can. It says, I got to squeeze, I got to push, I got to relax, I got to squeeze, I got to push. It can't do it. Can't so down. when your heart is going too fast, either from medications or from stress, for, from different things, again, the person's going to have problems with their pressure. It could be too high, it could be too low, and they're at risk of a fall. Okay, so let's take another look. I know we've given lots of examples, but this is really, really important because high blood pressure can be affected by so many different things. When you think of those narrow blood vessels, this is just another still image, right? It shows how the artery on the far side, it's normal. It's nice, it's round, it's open. You could see uh, blood cells flowing through that really nicely. Then as a person starts developing that pre-hypertension, that, that where the blood pressure is just heading out, out of normal but not, hasn't been diagnosed, what's happening inside that vessel is the blood flow is starting to get a little bit harder because it's having to try to get through that blockage. Okay, Then th that third picture over, there is hardly any blood flow getting there. So again, thinking of the 401, if we're down from eight lanes down to one lane, nobody on that highway is happy. Blood flow is really slow. Things are not going to be uh, very calm for the people in there and it's very hard for the heart to deliver the nutrients to your body when it's trying to get through blood vessels like that. Okay, then when we talked about we had our heart function, we had the narrowing of the arteries, and now we've got blood sugars, right? So I'm sure in other uh, discussions there was talk about with, I know Holly, she had these, but when your blood sugars are chronically high, for people who have diabetes and they're struggling to get their, their blood sugars under control, they don't, might also notice that maybe they actually have to be on more blood pressure medications. And the reason why is when you look at this first little guy, so this represents uh, blood sugar, so the white little bits here, that's the sugar and it's in a normal amount and the blood flows nice and smooth, right? No problems there. The heart isn't gonna struggle with that at all. So for this person, if they have diabetes, their blood is flowing this way, their hemoglobin A1Cs, or those averages that we do three or four times a year, there's probably six or less. Their diabetes is under good control. But if a person's blood sugar is seven, eight, nine, that hemoglobin, this is what's happening. There is not much movement. 
your blood starts to look and feel like frozen maple syrup to your heart, right? It's harder to push this through. How is that heart supposed to manage that millions and millions of times over the course of your lifetime if the blood is sticky, okay? All right, so what does Heart and Stroke Canada say about high blood pressure? Because they're the experts, right? And there's loads of information that's on their web page, my BP action plan. But the main thing is that we need to understand that lots of people have high blood pressure. Six million Canadians have high blood pressure. That represents 19% of the population. But what's even more concerning is that there are a lot of people of it here in Canada that are actually unaware that they have high blood pressure or we're just deciding well we're just going to wait and watch it okay and six only 66 percent of the people who are diagnosed with high blood pressure actually have it treated and under control and treated I want to make sure people are thinking Treating means taking your medications every day and taking it the way the doctor thinks you're taking it. It really is important, and we're going to talk about medication safety a little bit later on, to take these meds the way the doctor, your nurse practitioner, your healthcare provider has suggested. Okay? Nine out of ten Canadians will actually develop high blood pressure, hypertension over the course of their life. So this is really important that we need to be talking to your friends, your family, and what are your numbers? Do you understand that I, I want you to be healthy as we age together? Okay. One in three Canadians who have high blood pressure would actually have normal blood pressure if they would consume less sodium in their diets. Huge. That's a, that is a really scary statistic. When you think of the impact of having a heart attack, having a stroke, having kidney damage, uh, and then if we could just get people to work on lowering their sodium, uh, improving their exercise activities, we would have a, a much healthier population. Okay? And now this one, women with high blood pressure have a three and a half times risk of developing heart disease if they have high blood pressure compared to women who have normal high blood pressure. Again, it's really important for people to know what your numbers are so that you can make the right choices around what you're doing, what you have control over. Okay, so let's take a look. These are the factors that will affect your blood pressure. We have medications, and I know Cora has gone through medications, right? We have stress. So it's really important that you work on stress, not only from a mental health perspective but when we're stressed our body is ramped up it actually thinks that something is chasing us so Connie when you talked about my my blood pressure is high sometime and then it's low or when people are dealing with stress from family members or from workplace their body is trying to get them ready for a fight their body is trying to get get them ready to get set on your mark get set and go so it's it's sending all these chemicals out to your body that makes your heart rate go higher, makes your, your blood pressure go higher, and it sends out all these chemicals and hormones trying to get you ready. But chronic stress will cause high blood pressure. Okay, I've talked about smoking and alcohol consumption. Both of those things will cause high blood pressure, and it makes it difficult when you're on high pl blood pressure medication to actually control your blood pressure when you're smoking or when you're drinking higher amounts of alcohol. Okay, So for the average Canadian, the safe amount of, drink, of alcohol that can be consumed according to the guidelines is typically two a day for men and one a day for women. And the glasses of wine that have gone from small to big have, is a big problem. So when I say two glasses of wine is okay, I'm talking 10 ounces. I'm not talking about these great big glasses, goblets of wine that we have. And there is no safe amount of smoking. There is no safe amount of nicotine because it causes that instant rush of high blood pressure and it stays elevated for quite a long time. It also encourages the blood vessels to get 
more irritated and it encourages the plaque to build up even faster. Okay, so then we talked about that plaque buildup and the blood consistency, the, ex the activity level. So the more active you are, the better your blood pressure will be. The more that you're spending time sitting down watching TV, sitting and watching people do other things around you, you're going to have more problems with your, with your blood pressure. Okay. Diet, the people who have higher sodiums, and we have already talked about that, when you're eating a lot of sodium, it's hard to control your blood pressure. Oftentimes people have to be on one, more than one medications when they're not able to make the changes in their diet. And diets that are higher in fats, that releases more cholesterol, releases more uh, triglycerides into your bloodstream, again causing that buildup of the plaque on the, the sides of your vessels making it harder to control your blood pressure. Okay. And then the hydration level. So when you think of how that blood is flowing through those blood, uh, blood vessels, if we have been deciding that we don't like to get up in the middle of the night to drink, so we're gonna stop drinking sooner and sooner, earlier and earlier during the day, you're at risk of blood pressure problems because now the body again, like that video where you couldn't see anything going by, the video, um, the blood vessels actually have to contract down tighter to try to make sure that that brain gets the right amount of nutrients all the time. So uh, hydration level is quite important. Okay, so low blood pressure, right? Everything that we've talked about to now has been the problems with high blood pressure. But there's also that other side. So low blood pressure will also cause problems, okay? When your blood pressure is too low, the brain is going to suffer and the brain doesn't like that. The brain needs that constant amount of nutrients, of oxygen, otherwise it doesn't function very well. Okay? The symptoms of that, and we, uh, there was dizziness, lightheadedness, feeling faint, feeling really fatigued, having a hard time concentrating, blurred vision, nausea, feeling cold, clammy, lots and lots of thirst and headaches. So these are really vague symptoms, but it's, it's something to really listen to. And we often, when I'm at the hospital, a person will come in with low blood pressure. Perhaps they've skipped breakfast, they've gone to church, they've gone to a morning event, and then they go to stand up and they feel woozy and then they fall. And those symptoms are right there. Typically, if you see a person before they faint, they look a little bit pale, they look a little bit diaphoretic, they perhaps have clammy skin, right? Or they could even be complaining of problems with their vision. So you need to listen to those symptoms that your body has given you, okay? This, has anybody ever had this where you've gotten up out of bed, been laying down for a nap, been laying down because you've been stuck in bed with a flu, with an illness. You've just gone to bed and now you have to get up quickly. And then as you get up really quickly, you get a little bit of dizziness, a little bit lightheadedness. That's called postural hypo hypotension. It's defined as a decrease in that systolic pressure of 20 milligrams of mercury or that bottom number dropping down by 10 milligrams of mercury, millimeters of mercury. What's really important though is it typically happens within two minutes. So you've gone from sitting, from lying, you're on your way to the bathroom and by the time you get to the toilet, you're feeling dizzy and down you go, right? It doesn't happen instantly and that's what causes problems where people don't get enough of a warning sign that that's coming on. So why does that, right? What else can cause this? So when we think of that heart that's struggling with high blood pressure, constantly having to push against the high stuff, and you go from a lying position to a sitting position, lying to standing, sorry, lying, right? You're all of a sudden, a lot of the resistance has been taken away. So the blood goes dropping down, just like an elevator, goes all the way down, and the heart doesn't have enough time to pump back up. People who have heart failure or even atherosclerosis, it's that same thing because everything is so stiff, it can't react to those changes. 
when we talked about people who are struggling with diabetes, there's actually something that's happening to the, the, your ability to control how well your nerves can control the blood vessels. So when people are struggling with their diabetes, sometimes they will develop a condition where they can't feel their fingers or their toes, neuropathy. The same thing can actually happen to how the body controls how tight it wants those blood vessels to become. And people who are struggling with their diabetes, they're more at risk of developing this condition where they can't readjust the pressures as they stand up. We have medications that will cause you to have lower blood pressure. So if that's happening, you need to let your prescriber know and see if there's anything else we can do about that. We're going to be talking about dehydration next and anemia. Okay, and even prolonged bed rest. So oftentimes we'll ask people, if you're stuck in bed, please just get up and sit at the side of the bed for a few minutes. Move your feet around, do something to get, let that, those two minutes pass to give your body a chance to accommodate. Okay, it typically happens when you go from one position to the other position really quickly. And in the morning, our blood pressures are normally lower. So if we are already dealing with a low blood pressure and then we get up quickly to go check on something in the kitchen or to get up quickly because you have to go to the bathroom, you're at risk of, of having a, a postural drop in your blood pressure. And then earlier when we had talked about alcohol, so if you have a great big meal and you have a couple of drinks with that, or if you just have a great big meal all on its own, again, a lot of your blood volume is going to your belly and it's actually working on doing the digesting part. So then when you go from a sitting to a standing position, there's not enough time to get the blood pressure, to sh move the blood out to where it needs to be go so it can get up to your head, okay? Then if you think of when you're sitting on the toilet, and I know this isn't the funnest topic to talk about, but if you're sitting on the toilet and you're having problems having a bowel movement and you're pushing down, you're actually, you are bearing down and you're, you're increasing the pressure in your abdomen and you're decreasing blood flow that goes to your heart. So when you're done on the toilet, you stand up and now all the blood is not where it's supposed to be. So that's why sometimes a person will struggle when they've been sitting on the toilet. Okay, when you're ill, you're dehydrated, you've been laying down for three or four days and your body has forgotten what it means to tighten up. So you always have to be aware of that. And then if you're becoming anxious or panicky, so when we talked about that heart rate at 223, when we're feeling stressed, our, we're not getting good blood flow, so our body might not be able to manage when you go from those different body position changes. Okay. Right, so again, have you ever stood up too quickly, right? So we talked about this, the gravity is pulling the blood down. It heads down to our feet and we need those two minutes to get back, get the pressure back where it needs to be, right? That brain is in constant need of the nutrients, right? If you don't get that constant flow, then your body will say, well, I'm gonna put you down on the floor so I can get the blood, the nutrients that I want. It's a way of making sure that it gets what it wants. Okay, so it's a mechanism to help protect the brain. Okay, so it's really important when you're getting out of the chair, when you're getting up out of the bed, to really go slow. Take your time. Make sure that you're rising slowly and with purpose. If you're feeling dizzy like headed, don't push through it because it's going to be worse in another 30 more seconds. So sit back down, wait for those feelings to pass, right? Same thing applies when you're getting out of bed in the morning. Sit up at the side of the bed before getting up and leaving, okay? Give your heart a chance to adjust to those positions that you're, you're changing from, okay? Other ways to avoid it is hydration, taking your time, Exercise before standing. So oftentimes when a person is in the hospital or has been uh, laying down for quite a while, we'll ask them to sit at the side of the bed and pump their ankles, move their ankles around. It just helps squeeze and gets everything to come up a bit more. Be aware of how the heat or alcohol affects you and make sure that you're being careful with that. Do what you can do with using what you've learned through the nutrition aspects 
the healthier diets. Hopefully you're not going to have to strain too much with your stool. And then for gentlemen, especially in the middle of the night, come and sit down on the toilet instead of standing because when you're emptying your bladder, you're pushing. Again, you're decreasing the amount of blood that's going up to your brain. So sit down to pass your urine, especially in the middle of the night. Okay? Are you drinking enough? Right? So 75% of people who are 65 and older are actually dehydrated. So when you think of that video and those blood cells where the heart was pumping but you didn't see anything going through, right, that person is going to have problems with low blood pressure. Okay? How much you drink will always depend on how hot it is, what the climate is like. Right? It's going to depend on your activity. We, people, when they're exercising, they tend to drink more and that's what we want. Your medications are going to affect how well you're able to stay hydrated. So again, talk to your provider and see, should you be making sure you're drinking two liters of fluid or should you be restricting your fluid based on your medications? Other health conditions and consumptions of coffees, teas, and alcohol. So what do coffees and teas do to your hydration status? make you pee, right? It's a, it's a diuretic. So we like to encourage that if you have your coffee or tea, have a glass of water and have that at the same time. So you're matching cup per cup of fluids. Caffeinated beverage with just plain old water. Okay? So here we've got just this nice summary, right? What else, how do, what can I do? And is there any, is there any point? Because there's so many things that can go wrong with my blood pressure. But did you know that losing weight, so up to 10 kilograms, you could have a massive improvement in your blood pressure and, and lose or drop 20 millimeters of mercury off that top number. Amy has talked about different ways of healthier eating and when you improve your diet, you can actually get the improvements there that's on the screen between eight and 14 of milligrams, millimeters of mercury. So thinking of where you are on that scale of the, the reds, the greens, the yellows, it wouldn't it be nice if you could just drop your blood pressure by 10 points, you're not gonna have high blood pressure anymore. Okay. Looking at your sodium intake. So this is an old slide. It says try to have less than 2.4 grams or 2,400 milligrams of sodium. The number doesn't seem to matter t as much to me when I'm talking to people. I would really just want people to know how much they're eating and then find ways of decreasing their sodium. Now the recommendations are around 12 to 1400 milligrams, especially if you have problems with your heart. But start someplace small. So take a look at one meal and see what you're eating and then see if you can bring those down. Okay. Physical activity. I know there's been lots of discussions, but working towards 30 minutes a day, whether it's in five minute increments, 10 minute increments, and then building from there, you're going to bring down your blood pressure by 10 points. That would be great, right? Looking at your alcohol intake, see if that will give you a, an improvement as well, and it will save you on calories, and it will make it easier for your weight to come down. Okay? I talked about medications. Medications will make your blood pressure too high, it'll make it too low, sometimes these side effects. So you want to make sure you're talking to your prescriber and finding out what medications might be impacting my blood pressure. Then you would need to follow through and actually take the medications as prescribed. Blood, pressures that, blood pressure medication that you take twice a day, you need to take it at the same time every day. You don't need to be taking it at noon one day and then at bedtime the next day. You're not going to have good control, right? So make sure you pair it with something so you get through routine times. And then if you have any questions or concerns, make sure you're talking to your provider about that as well as your pharmacist. So if you're having problems with side effects, sometimes we can adjust the times or the dosages to make it easier for you to stay on those medications. And then as you go from physician to specialist to another healthcare provider, make sure they all have a good list to look at and bring that list with you to all appointments. Okay. So th the physical activity, I'm not going to go into this because I know it's been so well uh, discussed and reviewed and encouraged, but it has a huge impact. 
the more a person is able to be physically active, the more exercise a person is doing. They're bringing down their risk factors for high blood pressure, decreasing their risk of all of those complications, and most of all, they feel better. So that's what we want, right? It reduces your high blood pressure. It helps you manage your weight. It helps you bring, uh, make adjustments in your cholesterol, so it pushes up the healthy, happy cholesterols. It brings down the lower cholesterols. It improves your circulation, and it actually makes it easier for you to do the stuff that you want to do around the house, outside. It keeps you active so that you can be doing more stuff and enjoying your life to the fullest, okay? And one of the reasons is because it helps get the oxygen to the rest of your body. Okay, so that textbook, perfect blood pressure is 120 over 80, but it's really important for you guys to know your numbers and then know, work with your team to get yourself as close to that as possible, okay? It can be modified effectively through diet and exercise. We've, I'm sure that has been repeated, repeated all the way along, right? Just because your blood pressure is low doesn't mean that you're out of, out of the, the way of possible harm. So you want to make sure that you're doing what you can to keep your blood pressure in a healthy range. Okay? And make sure that you're seeing your doctor regularly, having your blood pressure checked to make sure that it's not too low or too high. That's it. And then we're all done. Is there any other questions or concerns? Yeah. Yay. Yes. Okay. Lisa, Lisa, I do have one question. Yep. Um, when it comes to checking the blood pressure, if I was to go to the local pharmacy mm -hmm. to put my arm in one of those uh, machines, is yep. that adequate enough? Is that something you would? Yep. Uh, okay. So as long as you. Sorry. Yep. Repeat the oh, question. Repeat yep. the question. Repeat. So okay. Thank you. Okay. So that question was going to the drugstore and putting your arm into that blood pressure machine. Is that a good practice? Is that something that's helpful? And it is something that is helpful for your physician because sometimes our blood pressures are going to vary uh, when we go running into the doctor's office. But the things you need to make sure when you do those uh, monitoring that you have been sitting down quietly quietly in the store for five to ten minutes, that you haven't had a cup of coffee while waiting to get your turn on the blood pressure machine, right? And then typically, if you could do that blood pressure at the same time each, each time you're in there, it's going to make it easier for the physician to know whether or not they need to make an adjustment with medications. But for you yourself, it's really, it's a good way just to double check. Am I online? Am I staying where the physician would like my blood pressure to be, where the, my provider would like me to be? Yeah. And do you know of blood pressure clinics in the area? Do you know if there's, I know years ago there used to be one at the senior center. Is that still ongoing or is that? I, I think they do blood pressures. Yeah. It's uh, in a booklet, I can't remember. Uh, I'm not. 100% certain we did. We used to run that clinic, but I'm not certain. Okay. Um, but that would, right, most of the doctor's offices are okay if you call in and say, I just want to get my blood pressure checked. So if that blood pressure clinic isn't available and those blood pressure machines aren't there at the drugstores that you use, asking just to have somebody just check your blood pressure, get that done and so it builds up a history so the doctors, your providers know that this is how you're trending. Excellent. Is that okay? Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Lisa. Yes. I, I've noticed that even when I go to the dentist now, just for a checkup, they'll check your blood pressure before they even start. Yeah. A dentist. A dentist, right? Even, well, mine does, sorry. I'm going to see my hygienist before they even start to check my blood pressure. So it's a, right, remember when you think of all the people who have high blood pressure who don't know. Right. What a perfect place to get your blood pressure checked. You're sitting down, you're laying, right? They maybe have let you sit quietly. I don't know how calm you would be before a hygienist goes to start cleaning, but it's a really good place to get your blood pressure checked. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yep. I've never had it done in my doctor. Yep. Myself. Every hygienist, right? Every yeah. no. person is, because no. it's a really good place to get some things yeah. checked out. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Lisa, for that fabulous presentation. I hope you guys viewing at home found that information valuable and informative. So remember, see your doctor regularly. Know your numbers. 
Lisa also mentioned the positive impact that exercise can have on controlling your blood pressure. So if you would like to know where the free classes are in your area, stay tuned to the end of this presentation and contact information will be displayed on the screen. Our glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we do. And it takes an entire community to prevent a fall. Thank you. For more information about the free, smart, gentle exercise programs in your area, check out the Vaughn Smart website at www.vonsmartexercise.com or contact Smart Program Coordinator Kelly G by phone 519-323-2330 extension 4954 or by email at kelly.gee at von.ca.
The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom.